Hello and uh, welcome to this uh, online guided tour of the uh, Dachau concentration camp memorial. I do apologize for the delay. We had a few technical problems. My name is uh, Raffaella Merlini and today I'm going to talk about the role played by the uh, propaganda in connection with the concentration camps. Um, please feel free to type in all your questions. My colleague Dominic will answer in writing or uh, my colleague Luisa, who is doing the filming for us, will read uh, the question uh, aloud to me. Now, um, Nazi concentration camps are uh, associated with the Holocaust, with the Shoah, but the initial purpose of concentration camps was not against Jews, but against political opponents. There were Jews from the very start in the concentration camp, but initially they were taken because of their political ideas, not because they were Jewish. Having said that, Jewish political opponents were treated even worse than the non-Jewish from the very start. In the elections of November 1932, Hitler will gain 33% of the votes, and on the 30th of January 1933, uh, he'll be appointed Chancellor. Only weeks later, on the 21st of March 1933, this article will be published on a local newspaper and it reports that the day before Heinrich Himmler, who at the time was head of the Bavarian police and of the SS, he had announced in a press conference that there was going to be a concentration camp here in Dachau. So it was not a secret that there were concentration camps. Also from abroad, people knew that there were concentration camps in Germany. But, of course, if you read the article, the concentration camp is presented as something positive, as a place for potential terrorists, um, uh, communists and social democrats. In fact, with the Russian Revolution still very fresh in people's memory, it was not difficult for the Nazis to try and portray all communists and some social democrats as potential terrorists. So uh, they are um, presented here as people who are destabilizing the German society and the German economy. So let's take uh, these uh, troublemakers away from the streets, away from the factories. Nothing bad will happen to them. We'll just re-educate them and turn them into good citizens again. Uh, and in the meantime, Germany will be able to flourish again. This is the message of the article. The next day, the 22nd of March, the very first prisoners will be brought here. But why here? Well, the answer is given by those buildings over there. They were part of a gunpowder and munition factory operating here between 1915 and 1919. With uh, uh, the end of the First World War and the Treaty of Versailles, Germany is obliged to demilitarize and uh, so reduce its army to a minimum and stop any military production. So this factory was shut down. The 8,000 workers that had been working here were dismissed, the area abandoned for several years, but it was quite practical for the Nazis to turn into a concentration camp because they had a lot of useful infrastructure. They had warehouses, a railway line, and the barracks where the workers had lodged. Also, uh, it was uh, a, at a distance from the town of Dachau because the town of Dachau at the time was much smaller than it is now, so it was uh, quite a bit away, so that the uh, Nazis were far enough from people to do what they wanted, but at the same time they were strategically close to Munich at the time, which was very active politically, so um, uh, many uh, prisoners to bring here. Uh, the area around Dachau had been mainly rural. The only significant industry in the neighborhood, apart from the uh, gunpowder and munition factory, had been a paper factory. Uh, the local population had not shown much support for the Nazis in the elections. They had voted more for uh, left-wing parties or um, the Catholic party. Still, uh, the initial reaction to the news of having a concentration camp in the neighborhood was not negative. 
because they actually hoped for uh, jobs, for employment, because this area had been afflicted by very high rates of unemployment, so they were hoping maybe to get a, a job working for the camp or earn some money uh, supplying the camp for, with what they needed. Um, and initially there is an economic return on the area, but as the SS start making systematic use of the prisoners as slave labour, they uh, will produce all they need and they will not need to go and buy it in the neighbourhood. Um, only the local sausage maker and a few beer halls will continue having the SS as regular customers. Beyond uh, those trees, there used to be the main entrance. We can have uh, an idea of what the um, building looked like at the time uh, with, uh, in this photograph taken by the SS. And we can see that it's a fairly nice building. There's only one guard who doesn't look too terrifying and nice little flowers at the windowsill. It looks very harmless. Uh, I would like you to compare this uh, photograph of this building in the photograph with the building over here. Uh, it's not easy for my colleague to be able to get a full picture of it, but uh, here on this building, uh, which was the entrance to the prisoners' camp, there never were flowers at the windowsills, and there's a watchtower. On that watchtower, at the time, there would have been searchlights and machine guns, so definitely not as harmless, as pretty looking as the main entrance, because we're now inside the SS camp, and so they didn't need the pretty facade for the outside world. We said that with the concentration camps, the Nazis wanted to get rid of political opposition, and the SS meant to do that radically, breaking down political opponents physically and psychologically. So humiliation, torture, and arbitrary violence was something that the prisoners had to endure every day from the start here. Uh, already by the end of May, 12 prisoners had died here, so uh, a local prosecutor, Karl Winterberger, uh, opened, uh, uh, started an, an investigation. Unfortunately, Himmler was able to have the investigation shelved, but this was a first lesson to the SS that they had to be a little more cautious, uh, a little more discreet with their violence. They will... Uh, um, issue new regulations so as to uh, practically protect SS guards from future uh, interference by the judiciary. They will also introduce total secrecy about the camp and they will publish on the local newspapers notices um, uh, warning civilians that they uh, are not uh, allowed, that it is, uh, um, it is not allowed to uh, come close to the concentration camp. And anybody who will be found in the proximity of a concentration camp will be offered the opportunity of satisfying his curiosity by a prolonged study of a concentration camp. So if you were found in the neighborhood in the, uh, near the camp, you would be arrested and become a prisoner too. Uh, let us uh, now go inside what used to be the uh, prisoners' camp. This building was called Jour House. Uh, it had, uh, which is a military term, it had the offices of the guards. Now we'll come close to uh, the gate. Uh, this gate uh, was stolen in November 2014. It will be found a year later. Uh, but the original gate is now in the museum. This is a replica. You can notice the inscription, uh, Arbeit macht frei, which was also in Auschwitz and two other concentration camps. Uh, it means uh, work sets you free. Was it true here that work would set you free? Of course not. Uh, why would they have it in the gate if it was not true? Uh, well, the logical explanation would be to motivate prisoners to work harder. But we actually know from survivors that they knew that that was not true. Here we have Edgar Cooper Kolberitz, who was a German journalist and poet and also a prisoner here. And he wrote a poem called The Lie in the Gate. 
because they knew that that was a lie. The way they perceived it at the time was just as one of the many ways the SS had of making fun of them. But probably the initial purpose of the uh, inscription was again propaganda because uh, this was considered a model concentration camp and there were visitors who came here. We know again from survivors that when visitors came a special siren would go off, all the ugly things would be removed and only a small number of duly instructed prisoners could be seen and could talk to the visitors. So of course uh, uh, the inscription gave the idea of a re-education institution and uh, they uh, would get a totally distorted impression of the camp. To uh, give you an idea of how effective this approach was, I'll read you two quotes. Um, one is from an article written by a Dutch clergyman, Mr. Turenbo, uh, and he writes for a Dutch newspaper in December 1933. And he writes, In the summer, a swimming pool that be in, will be enlarged and very large sports grounds provide the necessary pleasant and diversity and relaxation. Reports on regularly imposed mistreatment is thus part of a land of fables. I had the impression, and various prisoners explicitly confirmed it, that some of them were better off in Dachau than at home. Another quote is from a letter written to Himmler in August 1938 by Guillaume Favre, who at the time was member of the Committee of the Red Cross, and he writes... That is why I would like to stress here that everything that I saw and heard, and also living condition, the material and hygiene facilities of the camp, including the treatment, the nourishment and the prisoners' work, made a very positive impression on me. Now what you see uh, uh, in front of us used to be the roll call square. On this square, uh, prisoners had to stand to attention Every day, at least twice a day, morning and evening. Morning meant waking up at four in summer, at five in winter, and then standing here and wait to be counted. But there were thousands of them, so it took a long time to count them all, at least an hour, if not longer. And this, whatever the weather, whether it was pouring with rain, freezing cold, snowing, still they had to stand here and then again after a hard day's work. Here we have an image of these, uh, this roll call square, oh, this roll call. Uh, this, though, is not a random photograph, it's a stage photograph, and the photographer deliberately took the photograph from above to present the prisoners as inferior human beings, because differentiating uh, um, people between uh, inferior and superior was a very uh, um, consistent part of the uh, Nazi ideology. You notice uh, that also they have uh, striped trousers, shaved heads. You automatically think of convicts, of people who have committed a crime. And it is uh, therefore right that they should be punished. And it does look as if they are looking down because they feel guilty about something. But it's not true. It's just the way the photograph is taken from above to present these prisoners as inferior and bad people. Plus, the photographer took big muscular men so that if people from the outside heard that these bad people were doing hard manual labor, they were not supposed to feel sorry for them. This is a propaganda photograph like this one here presenting the typical inmates of a concentration camp. Here we have a, a, a communist, somebody who's defined as work shy, too lazy to work. In fact, according to the Nazis, those who were unemployed were not just people who were out of a job, they were people who didn't want to work. And uh, here we also have uh, somebody who's defined as a professional criminal. So the concentration camp is not just a place for political repression, but also for social cleansing. All the undesirable are taken away and brought into the concentration camp. In fact, all three men here have in common that they look very ugly and mean, not the kind of person you'd like to meet in a dark night in an empty street. The message is, let's get rid of this scum and make Germany safe again. This is propaganda. I'll show you two uh, real prisoners. This is Walter Hebig. He was a, a communist, but doesn't look as ugly and mean as the other person. He was 30 years old. 
he was uh, arrested because he'd been trying to print a secret newsletter. Of course, the Nazis had uh, abolished freedom of press, so he was arrested in September 1933, brought here in September 1933. By July 1934, he lived no more. He'd been shot here in Dachau. Another prisoner who doesn't look very dangerous to me is Hans Gasparic. He was a 17-year-old schoolboy. Uh, he uh, did a graffiti writing Hitler equals war. And for this so-called crime, he'll have to spend the whole of the Nazi dictatorship in a concentration camp. Now, it's raining pretty hard, so let's go inside the museum. This camp was um, uh, expanded in uh, 1938 and 1939 uh, and throughout the 12 years there will be uh, over 200,000 prisoners uh, in uh, the concentration camp and uh, at least 41,000 of them will die here. Uh, the camp was liberated at the end of April 1945 and uh, uh, by two American divisions who will turn the uh, camp in a detention area for Nazi criminals. Then um, in 1948, uh, the uh, camp will be transformed in a refugee camp. Uh, the barracks um, will, have, uh, will be altered and deteriorated. So uh, when in the 1960s, uh, the committee of the survivors manages to turn the whole area into memorial, they realized uh, that the barracks had been to altered and deteriorated, so they pull them all down and reconstruct two of them to give visitors an idea of what they looked like at the time. Whereas, uh, so these are reconstructed, whereas uh, this building is original. Uh, it was the main building uh, in the prisoners' camp. It had the kitchen, the registration room, shower room, and several workshops. And it now houses the museum and the offices of the administration of the memorial. Uh, we'll go inside uh, the museum and the first room used to be a um, workshop whereas now we notice a big map with all the various uh, concentration camps operating during the Second World War. The big black squares are the main camps, the little grey ones are satellite camps. In uh, September 1939, with the invasion of Poland, Nazi Germany starts the Second World War. And in the first years of the war, Nazi Germany seems to be invincible. Nobody seems to be able to stop this force that is invading one country after the other. Concentration camps had proved very effective in suppressing political repression in Germany. So uh, the Nazis will set up uh, concentration camps in all the occupied territories. Now, uh, the use of concentration camps is not unique of a Nazi dictatorship. Also, other crimes like uh, um, political repression, war, colonization, discrimination, racism, slavery, and even genocides are horrors that have happened uh, at different times in different parts of the world, unfortunately. Um, what is unique of the Nazi concentration camp, though, is the Holocaust, the Shoah, as a planned, industrialized genocide. In fact, as from January 1942, there will be concentration camps that have as a main purpose that of being factories of death, of having murder as an output. The biggest, most well-known one is Auschwitz-Birkenau, but there will be several others in this map. They're all marked with a V that stands for Vernichtungslager, extermination camp. Uh, and you can see that all these camps are in Eastern Europe, mainly Poland. Why? Well, first of all, because the Nazi leaders wanted to keep it secret. They uh, knew they were committing a huge crime, and they didn't want the German uh, public opinion to be aware of what was happening in the extermination camp. So it was better to have them further away from home and in less densely populated areas. Secondly, the, uh, uh, according to the Nazi ideology, Eastern Europeans in general were considered so-called racially inferior to the superior German race or Nordic race, as they called it. 
Uh, so if a few Poles, Czechs, Russians got caught in the death machine, even without being Jewish, fine for the Nazis. Uh, all people they wanted to get rid of in the long run anyhow. In fact, um, the um, uh, repression in Eastern Europe was even harsher than in uh, Western Europe. Thirdly, the percentage of Jewish citizens was higher in Eastern Europe than in Western Europe, so it was just more practical to have them he here. Um, Anti-Semitism, though, was not invented by the Nazis. It's something that unfortunately exists since the beginning of Christianity. In fact, we can think of the word uh, ghetto uh, that is now internationally used. It is originally an Italian word because the first ghettos were in Catholic Italy. And also the idea of obliging Jewish citizens to wear specific clothes or patches on their clothes to make them immediately recognizable as Jews was not invented by the Nazis, but by an Italian pope in the Middle Ages. Throughout the Middle Ages, there was anti-Semitism in the whole of Europe, and uh, Jews were systematically used as scapegoats, blamed for whatever was going wrong at the time. Unfortunately, uh, this prejudice was exported in other parts of the world, and by the 1920s, there was still a lot of prejudice in the whole of Europe and Northern America. The Nazis make use of this existing prejudice, uh, again, using Jews as scapegoats, blaming them for whatever was going wrong in Germany, and they will start with anti-Jewish propaganda well before 1933. Here we have three examples of such propaganda. Here we see Jews portrayed as uh, devouring the German nation or uh, presented as fat, rich men who are greedy and want to become even richer. It is not true that all Jews were rich at the time, like it is not true now, but it was easy for the Nazis to point their finger to those Jewish families who were rich and to say to the non-Jewish family who was poor, the reason you're poor is because they've grabbed all the money. In general, they're presented as monsters who want to gain control over the whole world. All disgusting lies. But as from 1933, there will be no freedom of press, so nobody can contradict these lies. Germans will be uh, fed these lies day in, day out. And so the anti-Jewish propaganda was effective. Conditions for German Jews deteriorate throughout the uh, dictatorship. They were progressively limited in their in sorry, profession, in their uh, education, and their private life. Uh, and in uh, November 1938, there was going to be a huge pogrom. Um, all uh, in Germany, all the synagogues are burnt down, all the Jewish-owned shops and Jewish-owned uh, factories are broken into and looted, and, the and it'll be then denominated the Kristallnacht, Night of a Broken Glass, and the next day, 30,000 Jewish men are taken to concentration camps. This time, no longer because of their political ideas, they just happen to be Jewish. 11,000 of them will be brought here to Dachau. The anti-Jewish propaganda was not directly connected with the concentration camp, but in enforced the idea of the society divided in people who are superior and people who are inferior, in uh, creating an us against them, and the image of a new German state that has to defend itself from this enemy within. And unfortunately, it will pave the way for the horrid crimes committed during the war. This uh, room also was a workshop at the time, whereas now we're going to uh, a bigger room, uh, which is, uh, used to be used as uh, a registration room. And uh, in fact, people who had just arrived, who had just been brought to the camp, would have to come in from this door and then go inside this room and line up uh, on this side of, of the room, take all their clothes off, and stark naked, give in all their possessions. And uh, also, at the time, the room would be divided in two, only that instead of these metal tables, 
there would be wooden desks like that one over there. Behind the wooden desk, there would be prisoners who had the job of taking down the names of those who just arrived. And this would be one of the best jobs you could have here at the concentration camp because you were indoors doing office work instead of being out in the open air, in the rain, in the cold, doing hard manual labor. So you were very lucky if you were assigned to this work detail. Unfortunately, it was a small work detail and not many had that luck. Here we can see another photograph uh, which was part of the uh, propaganda. Again, it is taken from above and it was the cover of a magazine uh, called uh, München Illustrierte Presse, and it was uh, published in July 1933. And it has a long article inside, and the title of the, tart uh, the article is The uh, Truth About Dachau, uh, where, again, uh, prisoners are presented as uh, being in quite good conditions. And according to the article, they are uh, finally doing some honest work. And uh, they are presented as working as builders or as gardeners, so nothing too terrible. And um, uh, also, they are presented as uh, having tidy and clean uh, sleeping quarters. Uh, they also have a very big kitchen, giving the idea of plenty of food. And also, according to this article, the uh, prisoners have uh, sorry, uh, plenty of time for leisure and sport. Uh, here we see prisoners uh, going in for a swim and, uh, or enjoying a game of cards or sitting around on the lawn chatting. Similar photographs will be also published by an English newspaper uh, magazine. Uh, called uh, London, uh, illustra Illustrated in London News. And uh, again, uh, the prisoners are presented in good conditions, doing uh, normal work. Here there's a carpenter who, according to the, uh, to the article, has very modern uh, machinery to use. And also, uh, they, again, the uh, our journalist is impressed with the very spacious and efficient kitchens. And uh, the here prisoners are uh, receiving breakfast uh, in bed because they're in the sick bay, in the infirmary. And also in this article, it is uh, mentioned that prisoners have plenty of time for leisure. And here they are enjoying a game of chess. Whereas here the SS uh, men are... Um, presented in uh, military fashion. In fact, uh, the SS staged themselves as political soldiers, uh, which was something very important because uh, military tradition had been a big part of German culture and the military had always been seen as sort of uh, immune to um, civilian scrutiny. And uh, the SS would uh, glorify themselves, emphasizing how dangerous uh, the prisoners were. They were the enemy of the state, and they were callous, sly, and aggressive. Uh, they uh, also would say that, uh, as political soldiers, the SS were the only soldiers who were uh, confronted with the enemy day and night, even in peacetime. Uh, in 1938, two prisoners of the concentration camp of Buchenwald will manage to escape, killing an SS guard, and this will be reported in this way. He died for us. Albert Kalweit fell victim of an insidious, cowardly attack while performing his duty. While the German nation is peacefully going about its daily work, the SS man is permanently in contact with the enemy. Another newspaper will compare Kalweit's death to the one of his father in the First World War and presents both of them as heroes who had died in the eternal struggle between good and evil. The propaganda uh, focuses on the concentration camps in the early years of the dictatorship. Then once the dictatorship is consolidated, it will no longer feel the need to justify the uh, existence uh, of uh, the concentration camp. 
even less so as from 1949, because with the war, the propaganda is concentrating on nationalism and uh, in glorifying the victories and denying the uh, defeats. Also, um, with the uh, invasion, uh, uh, with the start of the Second World War, thousands of prisoners will be uh, brought from the occupied territories, also in the concentration camps in Germany. So most of the prisoners will become um, not German, uh, will be not German uh, prisoners anymore. And so uh, as foreigners, they are automatically seen as enemies. Um, in the pre-war phase, many prisoners were released, and those who were released had to sign a document in which they promised not to speak about the um, concentration camp once they were out of the camp. But, of course, some of them would uh, tell their uh, friends or close uh, relatives about the horrors that they'd uh, experienced or witnessed in the concentration camp, and um, uh, particularly brave was Martin uh, Grünwiedel. He was a, a, a communist prisoner. He was brought, one of the first brought here on the 22nd of March 1933. He will be released 11 months later and he writes a secret uh, report on uh, what had happened to him inside the camp. Uh, and uh, he, it will be 32 pages long and he will ma uh, manage to make 600 copies of it and uh, he will uh, be able to distribute it secretly. Also, Hans Beimler, uh, who was uh, a German prisoner, actually a German member of parliament, was uh, brought here in April 1933, uh, but he'll manage to escape. He's actually the only prisoner who manages to escape from inside the Dachau concentration camp. He will flee to the Soviet Union, where he writes a book uh, uh, on uh, the horrors of Dachau, uh, and it will be published in the Soviet Union and translated in uh, several languages. And also the uh, Social Democratic Party, after 1933, goes to exile in, uh, ex is exiled in uh, uh, the, um, Czechoslovakia, and from Prague they will publish um, uh, um, reports on the horrors that were happening in the concentration camp. So there were rumours uh, about the truth of Dachau. Uh, the, and uh, these unofficial rumours actually make the repression tool more effective because the propaganda presented concentration camps as harmless places for dangerous people, whereas these rumors made people aware that you didn't have to be such a huge criminal or terrorist to end up here, but as we have seen, um, comment or uh, um, graffiti would be sufficient to make you end up in a concentration camp. And since violence was so arbitrary inside a concentration camp, if you ended up in a concentration camp, even for having done something quite minor, you were not sure you'd ever come out. So it was just uh, wiser, safer to uh, keep your mouth shut and look the other way when bad things were happening. In fact, in Bavaria, there was a secret proverb that said, oh Lord, make me dumb so that in Dachau I do not come. So to conclude, we can say that the propaganda was effective in trying to give a positive image of the concentration camp, and many people will probably will have been taken in by the propaganda, but there were also people who were aware of the truth, uh, and unfortunately, some of these were probably uh, uh, approved of the brutality and lawlessness, seeing it as a necessary evil. But there were also some people who suspected or knew the truth, 
and disapproved. We will never know how many because, of course, to act, to do something uh, or say something uh, against the regime was very dangerous. So um, we can remember that most of the people who were here as prisoners were people who did have the courage to try and fight this dreadful dictatorship. And personally, I have the greatest admiration for them. Are there any questions? Uh, no? Then, <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Uh, for uh, your attention and your time. Please feel free to uh, let us know uh, all your suggestions and uh, your comments and uh, also give us suggestions for other topics you might be interested uh, in us um, presenting in our online guided tours. Thank you very much and bye-bye.